of my change of uh, geographical focus uh, to Central and Eastern Europe. I work at Exeter, but I'm originally, as you might guess, uh, kind of Central and Eastern European. Uh, first, as I guess most of you will not work in the region, uh, a bit of what is there in Central and Eastern Europe. I would, for this talk, divide this into three parts. <clears throat> One term, Central Europe here, uh, is basically the German-speaking countries. Uh, one termed East Central Europe, which is roughly the eastern part of the EU uh, and ex-Yugoslavia, more or less. And Eastern Europe, kind of true Eastern Europe, uh, which is the Ukraine, Belarus, and uh, Russia. Uh, and all the three uh, regions have uh, very different uh, archaeological records, historical records, and a very different uh, 20th century history and 21st century history that, of course, impact on how we do history and archaeology uh, in these regions. <clears throat> Going from the other end, uh, what do we mean by global Middle Ages? Uh, we have heard uh, views on this from the pre previous papers. Uh, I don't want to go into detail on this, but very broadly, a history and archaeology of the medieval period, so 500, 1500 CE, uh, including areas outside of Europe. Uh, and the Global Middle Ages approach makes the critique that it's all very Europe-centered. Uh, however, that Europe is not really Europe, but it's Northwestern Europe. Uh, so it's essentially Britain, Scandinavia, Low Countries, and parts of France, kind of Normandy, uh, Bretagne, and the Mediterranean. Uh, and pretty much everything is as is uh, not there. Why is it that Central and Eastern Europe is pretty much missing from uh, global Middle Ages? Uh, to look into that, uh, of course, the best approach from, from the present perspective, uh, where does the notion of global Middle Ages come from? It is largely an English-speaking thing. I think more the UK than the US, and, and also possibly more specifically more England than the rest of the UK. Uh, but I'm happy to be corrected on that. And what could it symbolize? And I don't necessarily mean conscious aspects only, but also things that I just at the back of people's minds, whether they want to or not. We all kind of have a mental map of the world in our heads, uh, and that will be shaped by where we were born, where, where we went to school, uh, what kind of people we know, and so on. Uh, and my idea from the outside was, if this could be a Britain and England, or Britain, or rather England, and the colonies think. Uh, and then reading uh, the abstract for the last paper of this session, I had to realize that it's not even the full colonial world. Uh, I must admit, I'm not 100% familiar with uh, the British Empire and uh, the full set of colonies. Uh, so it would have been interesting to have that discussion uh, with uh, the people doing the last paper. Uh, and if my idea was if this could be a somewhat teleological prehistory of the British Empire and the colonial world. Uh, I would be very happy to, to have a discussion about this uh, afterwards. Because obviously I don't really have the British perspective. Uh, and when did this notion of global Middle Ages emerge or become popular? Uh, it was a time, I think this is pretty much the last five to seven years, uh, when Britain and specifically England was interrogating its relations to continental Europe and to the global world. And I would say that's not necessarily, that, that's rather not a coincidence. Again, I would be very curious about other people's perspectives uh, on this. And coming from the uh, Central and Eastern European end, uh, how is Central and Eastern Europe viewed uh, in 
English speaking medieval research. And the short answer is not at all, basically. Uh, so it's, uh, if we take an anthropological stance, it could be called a non-place, uh, meaning that it doesn't really have, uh, that it's seen as not having attached identities, or at least attached identities that would be relevant. Uh, and some parts of uh, Eastern Europe are exotic enough to be considered. I'm thinking here of Novgorod, for example, uh, and things that are kind of, kind of some, something Viking. Uh, that that could be that could be interesting. Some parts of the German-speaking world uh, are close enough to be uh, considered, and the North Sea and, and the Baltic coast uh, is that's kind of Scandinavian enough uh, to uh, fit in. Uh, but pretty much everything else is lost and not very much uh, not considered very much. <clears throat> and. Uh, the question is, what one specific theme of the session is uh, what can uh, archaeology contribute uh, to uh, global Middle Ages? And one aspect, in one aspect, Central and Eastern Europe is uh, different than Western Europe, uh, and that is the lack of written sources, or at least consistent written sources. Uh, before the 12th century, this doesn't really apply to the German-speaking world. Uh, at least not most of it, but it definitely applies to what I termed East Central Europe and Eastern Europe. So you basically can't really do a Western European type of historical research on East Central Europe and Eastern Europe because the, the historical sources, the written sources, are very simply not there. Uh, and this is where archaeology comes in. The archaeological record is there. It's not really known in, in an international context, uh, but it is there and it is available. It is interesting to consider that prehistoric archaeology is completely different in its approach to uh, Eastern and Central Europe, uh, different than medieval archaeology or medieval studies. Uh, prehistoric archaeology, at least these days, uh, sees the past as, as our common past as, as humanity. Uh, so uh, it considers things like when did social hierarchies appear, uh, when did technological innovations appear, and also migrations, but not necessarily in a national sense, which was, of course, not always the case. So we all know that there was a time uh, when prehistoric archaeology was also about chasing national, uh, national ancestors uh, in various parts of uh, the old world. And that time has, luckily by now, uh, passed. And my question, basically, with this whole paper would be, uh, can we get there for the medieval uh, period? I will get back to uh, this question at uh, the end of the presentation. Uh, and I would just like to show one example uh, of the embedded nature of Central and Eastern Europe in the global medieval world uh, from my own work. Uh, some of you in the room are familiar with uh, the project. Uh, it is about glass beads uh, in uh, Central Europe and in other parts of the world, uh, notably here uh, from uh, Scandinavia. Uh, I got, when we did this project, or actually when we were preparing to do this project, I uh, got uh, the reaction from many colleagues like, uh, especially, I must say, uh, male colleagues of the older generation, that you know, doing things with women's jewelry is not that interesting. And are you serious about doing this? Uh, but these bits, uh, apart from uh, that being a float uh, view in many ways, uh, these bits are an economic marker and show us things about the global uh, economic the global medieval economic world uh, that we don't have access to otherwise. So this all basically started uh, with me sitting at a conference probably 15 years ago. I knew the beads in the top image from Austria and somebody showed these beads uh, from Dibe in Denmark. And I just thought, these people have our beads. There, there is something wrong there. Uh, and wanted to look into this uh, for a long, long time. Uh, there has, of course, been previous work uh, on uh, these beads, 
uh, in the 70s, late 60s uh, and 70s, uh, notably by Reinhard André and uh, Johann Kalmer uh, from Germany and uh, from uh, Scandinavia, uh, respectively. Uh, they worked only on a typological basis, so they didn't do uh, chemical analysis. Uh, and uh, what they came to in, in terms of origin, again, without chemistry, uh, Andre was thinking of an Egyptian origin uh, of the glass beads uh, because of the natron source, and he knew that natron has something to do with, with glass making. So that, that was kind of a good, uh, that seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, and Skalma had a more uh, detailed uh, view on this, even there on his map, and this map is, is cut off where his map is cut off, so this is not, th there is nothing missing. Uh, so he indicated these three regions as uh, possible regions of origin and uh, made it clear that there are two main routes uh, how these beads uh, get to uh, Scandinavia, uh, which is what he was mainly interested in. Uh, we did a project in uh, 2019-2020 publications are in progress. Uh, the project was called Glass Networks, uh, Tracing Early Medieval Long Distance Trade, uh, 800,000 uh, CE. It was a Leverhulme project uh, with myself being PI and Andrew Shortland uh, being uh, QI. And we looked into these beads, roughly 200 of them, uh, both archeologically and uh, by chemical analysis. And uh, just to uh, give, given the time, uh, a very, very rough idea of the global uh, distribution of these finds. This is roughly uh, the uh, extent of the maximum distribution of these. Uh, so basically from Thailand to Zanzibar, uh, Mali, uh, the Northern Adriatic, uh, all across Central Europe. Uh, there are some very few pieces. There is one in York uh, and one in Ireland. Uh, there are quite a lot in Scandinavia. And we know that there are quite a lot in the Ukraine and in Russia. I was very much hoping to do a project on that. Uh, that's not really looking like it. Uh, at the moment and probably for a long time. Of course, we don't know, and it's incredibly hard to, uh, to, to make a full distribution map. Uh, so we, we don't know uh, how many uh, pieces are uh, the, uh, in these regions in, uh, in between. So it's basically just connecting the dots uh, of the maximum distribution. And it seems from the chemical analysis that the production centers are likely to have been somewhere uh, what, what is today Iraq and Iran. Uh, interestingly, exactly in that region, uh, practically none of these beads uh, survive. Uh, the European occurrence is part of a more global phenomenon, uh, but survival is by far the highest in Central Europe. Uh, so places like Slovenia, Hungary, Austria, uh, Czech Republic and parts of Germany. Uh, so we have hundreds of uh, beads uh, and at places like Thailand or Zanzibar or Mali or also uh, the British Isles, uh, you have kind of one or two or five. Uh, in Scandinavia, it's, it's, it's more like hundreds. Uh, so then we'll have uh, more. Uh, exact figure on that. Uh, so it's it's very, very uh, different amount surviving. Of course, this doesn't mean uh, that uh, most of these beads existed or were used in Central Europe. Uh, this is a preservation bias, very simply because we have furnished burials. Uh, this is late, uh, kind of late 8th century and 9th century. Uh, and we have uh, still furnished burials uh, at this stage. Uh, so it wouldn't really be possible to understand uh, this global phenomenon uh, without uh, including uh, East Central Europe. And that is something that baffles me again and again, not specifically about this project, but early medieval research in general, that there is an English-speaking approach of trying to look into relationship between 
uh, Northwestern Europe and the Mediterranean without looking at East Central Europe or Central Europe in the middle. Uh, that, that, that is something that I would be happy to, to hear uh, views on if you wanted to share them. And in terms of interpreting, back to these beads, in terms of interpreting them, uh, for example, in Africa, specifically in Mali, uh, they are seen as a, as a sign of Islamization. Uh, and uh, that, that's not really a narrative we, we would want to consider for Central Europe. Uh, it's, it's more likely some, something like slave trade uh, on, or, or something in that direction. Uh, so while this is a very global distribution, uh, the explanation behind it is not necessarily the same uh, all over the place. <clears throat> and getting back to the general perspective, uh, how do we get Central and Eastern Europe on the map of global medieval research? Uh, we could try and be more like prehistoric archaeology. Uh, and I think that would be a good idea to, to try that uh, and, and see the medieval past more as the common past of humanity as opposed to a my past, your past uh, approach. However, uh, national identities are a big part of the appeal for, especially early medieval archaeology, for the general public. So we are basically selling our archaeology by uh, play, playing into the national identities uh, aspect. And uh, it's an open question how to tackle that if the medieval past is to become uh, our common past as opposed to a national past or many national pasts. And I think global Middle Ages would be a very useful concept for this, but it would have to be inclusive. So not, not uh, bits and pieces here and there, uh, but a truly global perspective. Thank you.